welcome to episode 195 of the Postal Hub podcast. I'm Ian Kerr. Two guests this week. First up is Sandra Bonfigli from the UPU, who shares how the UPU is helping distribute essential safety supplies to postal workers in less developed countries during the pandemic. Then it's Paul Steidler from the Lexington Institute on the universal service obligation in the US postal system. Remember to check out the series of short videos Mara Krzyzewski and I have been releasing on LinkedIn and on YouTube. The video we released on Monday 27th of April was about President Trump's stance on USPS pricing for Amazon parcels. Coming up in just a moment, Sandra Bonfigli from the UPU. Joining me on the line is Sandra Bonfigli, who is from the Procurement Unit of the UPU's Development Cooperation Directorate. And we're going to talk about uh, the UPU's initiative to help send some essential personal protective equipment to uh, postal workers in least developed countries to help keep them safe during uh, during this pandemic. Sandra, welcome. Before we get too involved in the what we're actually what's actually happening here just tell us a little bit about the the unit where you work the, what does the development cooperation directorate do day to day at the directorate of development and cooperation as soon as a crisis looms like a natural disaster such uh, as floods for example earthquakes or this time the rapid spread of the coronavirus we immediately act to help the least developed countries that they are in a more vulnerable position. Uh, In most cases, our efforts are aimed uh, at getting the postal network up and running as soon as possible after a disaster so that it's ready to serve uh, its customers and fulfill its service obligation to to the citizens. So in this case... We've seen the pandemic affect many countries around the world quite severely um, and now making, making its way through all, all around the world. Tell us about this particular project. What are the, some of the medical supplies that are being provided under this program? Yes, exactly. In, in these unique cases with this pandemic, we shift uh, focus to the protection of the postal staff. We decided to buy a personal protection kit to the least developed countries. Uh, this project is uh, at the, be- the beginning. We have just set up the legal framework now for cooperation. Uh, the aim was to react quickly. Uh, it was very important to this epidemic. And, and yes, we are here now. So tell us about the UPU's role in this and how the UPU is helping coordinate this distribution of uh, protective equipment to um, various postal employees around the world. Yes, in total, uh, 37 uh, least developed countries uh, have responded to our inquiry and uh, they would like to receive these personal protection equipment kits. We have a total budget of 560,000 Swiss francs and uh, we managed to buy per country uh, 35,000 pairs of gloves. 135,000 protective masks and 1,500 bottles of disinfectant. In total, we will supply approximately 5 million of masks, 1,300,000 gloves and 55,000 of bottles of sanitizer. And so those kits that you mentioned, that was each of those kits, which was, I think you said 135,000 masks, 35,000 pairs of gloves, and then the disinfectant. Each country that has responded will get one of those kits. Is that right? Exactly, exactly. 35 LDCs will receive one of these kits. And it's been done in um, cooperation with the United Nations Office for Project Services. How does that organisation fit in with this? I can say that we are used to um, to set, uh, setting up projects uh, in a record time based on our efficient project management framework. We are used to that. But for this project, we had, uh, I think, a major challenge and uh, relating to the logistics. This is directly because of the closure of many airports. And uh, that means that fewer and fewer cargo planes are available for the delivery and to overcome this challenge, uh, that's why we reached out to one of our partners. 
the U uh, United Nations Office for Projects and Services and put things in place so that we will manage the logistics, the purchasing and transportation of the equipment. We will collaborate in that uh, on both sides. That's great to see that the UPU is helping bring together these resources to help postal workers around the world because just because you're in a different country doesn't mean you're facing a different kind of challenge, whether it's in delivery or whether it's in the post office. The risks are basically the same no matter where you are. As long as you're involved in the post, uh, you're going to be facing those same challenges. So it's great to see the UPU getting involved here. Uh, Sandra Bonfilli from the UPU, thank you very much for joining us today on the Postal Hub podcast. Thank you, Ian. Thank you very much. Joining me on the line is Paul Steidler. Paul is a senior fellow at the Lexington Institute. Paul, we're going to talk about the US Postal Service, but not in any sort of general terms. We want to talk about the universal service obligation uh, in the USA. And really, is it going to change? We've seen right now around the world there are discussions about the USO. There have been interim changes to letter delivery in some countries, which we might get to later. But, Paul, why don't we just start off with the, the easy one? What is the current uh, requirement of the US Postal Service when it comes to letter delivery? What is its universal service obligation? Well, the Postal Service is required to uh, deliver letters to every address in the United States and to um, do so in a uh, timely manner. It also is required to um, d deliver packages. And the USO, the, the um, specifics of it uh, outside of that are really not thoroughly defined by statute or uh, in other ways in the US. Right now, there's a um, great concern about the future of the Postal Service because of its finances and the possibility uh, of legislative reforms as part of additional financial assistance that the Postal Service may need. So it, it is emerging as a time when the USO has to be looked at. There's a presidential task force report that in December 2018 talked about the need to define the USO. That is, what services is the Postal Service going to provide and how are they going to be paid for? Uh, it seems clear that that should encompass a couple of things. One is that um, personal letter delivery should go to every address in the U.S. as well as correspondence from businesses and um, and also uh, government notices, which are extremely important or which have uh, legal ramifications and that those are items that um, only the uh, Postal Service has the um, ability to provide. I mean, it just seems, it seems quite extraordinary to me, though, Paul, that this isn't codified, if I can put it that way. I mean, if you look at many other countries, they'll have a USO which defines what a letter is by size and weight, what the delivery requirements are in terms of um, speed of delivery, uh, frequency of delivery, and the spread of delivery. So it might be that not every single address has service five or six days a week. It might only be a reduced number of days a week. And th th those are all set down either in an act or in an instrument of parliament or something like that. So if, if I understand it correctly, as part of all these discussions, because we we won't go into the things like you know the the, the pre-funding of pension obligations and all of that. I think we all understand that that is something that exists right now, and we all understand why it exists. But the question really is then, if um, there is going to be reform of the postal service or fun funding, or emergency funding, whatever it is, the concept of the USA needs to be be codified. The the Lexington Institute held a postal reform conference earlier this year. Just share with us a couple of things that came out of that with regard to what the USO could be for the USA or, or anything you can sort of share on, along those lines. Right. And, and Ian, I'd like to also mention the in, in the United States, the Postal Regulatory Commission, which is the um, regulator of the Postal Service, the principal regulator, has opened a docket to define what a letter is. Now, that took place shortly before the COVID-19 pandemic uh, took hold. Uh, but it is an area that uh, that is being reviewed and uh, is being looked at. 
The universal service obligation has also effectively been defined at times by the U.S. Congress, which, for example, has required that there be six-day delivery. And that has been a law that has been instituted every year since about uh, 1982. And it's understood by the Postal Service that they are going to have to um, have quick delivery times. And, you know, those measures and metrics are uh, are looked at uh, quite carefully. Uh, but with respect to the conference that you mentioned, uh, Robert Tao, the chairman of the Postal Regulatory Commission, uh, spoke at our Capitol Hill Postal Reform Conference. And really, he, he hammered home two very related and strong points. One is that the finances of the Postal Service are a mess, Uh, and that it would be best to fix those finances before they go off a cliff. Uh, Notably, the conference was on March 6, which is before the uh, pandemic took hold and before losses at uh, the Postal Service accelerated. But integral to that, and this is a point that he has made on uh, many other occasions as well, is the fact that the universal service obligation needs to be much more clearly defined. One of the things uh, that you know has been pointed out is that um, in 1996, as part of the uh, Telecommunications Act, what happened in the United States is that the Federal Communications Commission was given the authority to define what the universal service obligation should be for telecommunications. In other words, those things that are most key to be provided and um, to, to ensure that they are. And that is um, something that Congress empowered the commission to do. It would be helpful um, for the Postal Regulatory Commission to similarly get such broad parameters from Congress about what it wants, and perhaps six-day delivery is uh, is one of those, and most likely would be one of those. And then um, you could have that mission, those core activities, if you will, codified and uh, and better understood. So with uh, the Postal Service having uh, big financial problems and legislation of some kind, um, you know, likely in uh, weeks, if not months, uh, if not the next year, now is an uh, important time to take a look at that issue. We always talk about letters being in the CSO, the CSO, that shows how Australian I am, the uh, community service obligations, the universal service obligation. We always talk about the letters being part of that. Is there any talk in the USA about parcels becoming a universal service obligation since we've seen in the weeks since the pandemic hit many countries that an increasing reliance on e-commerce in order for people to get basics, uh, whether it's pharmaceuticals or food or whatever it might be, is there any talk of that, or is it really in, in the USA? Is there any talk of the parcels becoming a part of a universal service obligation definition? Uh, the short answer is yes, and it also depends on the parcel uh, that's being discussed. In 2018, the Trump administration basically met with everybody in the U.S. postal community and put together a uh, task force report about uh, postal reform that came out in December of 2018. And that document uh, should provide a lot of the basis for reform going forward. But but one of the things uh, that was mentioned in there is that pharmaceuticals should be seen as an essential service that the Postal Service provides, that that should come under the universal service obligation because it's in the public interest for people who need medicines to know that wherever they are, there is going to be um, an entity that uh, that delivers them. It is much harder, though, to make that case for a lot of other uh, consumer products and to, um, uh, and to say that the um, Postal Service should, in effect, be um, subsidized to provide them. It's an important discussion to have, but um, frankly, I'm I'm more concerned about the fact that we're just not um, discussing the USO uh, at all in the United States. There are these um, audacious demands by the Postal Service for additional assistance. It certainly looks like it is going to, at some point, need some additional assistance, but um, 
the need for the U for defining the universal service obligation has been long standing, and really the best chance to address it is in conjunction with um, uh, with the assistance that the postal service uh, is likely to need in the near future year. But from your perspective, and given what you've said about the push for reform and the um, cash situation at the U.S. Postal Service, and throw into the mix the need for a, a you know a perceived need for a definition of the USO, is there a chance that anything will actually happen in the, in a political context? Could, can could it be that? A, uh, whether it's a compromise or a consensus, however you like to term it, can be reached in order to take the, a step forward in all of this, whatever that step might be. In fact, I think there's a very good possibility of that. And really, over the next uh, six to 12 months, this might, this might be the last best chance for the USO to get defined. The, the US Congress has done, um, has done very little about postal matters. There's been one congressional hearing since that task force report uh, came out in December of 2018 about postal reform issues. So it's it's a very chaotic situation here in the U.S., like it is in many um, places right now, uh, politically and legislatively. It does appear in the coming months, coming weeks, if not months at some point, there is going to be um, discussion about additional assistance for the Postal Service, and um, if you'll pardon the pun, part and parcel of that should be defining the USO, because understanding the mission of the Postal Service and understanding how that's going to be paid for is, is key to establishing a business model that will enable the Postal Service to be at least break even going forward. And it has not been. It's lost money for 13 consecutive years. Its finances are are a uh, complete mess. Uh, it has a negative net worth of $71 billion, unfunded liabilities of over $143 billion. So the problems that it has uh, do long precede uh, COVID-19, and they, they occur in large part because there is not that, that mission that's uh, clearly understood. Um, that universal service obligation. When it comes to the, um, I mean, one of my questions was going to be about this, the the, the, sh- the medium term and long term survival of the postal service. We see it in a number of parts of the world where the losses in letters weighs down the rest of the business because it is it is a business. Whilst you might say, well, we only have losses in letters. That's great, but ultimately it's one business. So there's letters, there's parcels, there's post office services, there's retail services, there are the online services, et cetera, et cetera, that the various postal services offer. And I often discuss this from an Australian perspective where the uh, letters service in Australia was forecast to lose $1.5 billion over a period of time, and that was one of the main drivers for a reform of letters a few years ago in Australia. It was really hung upon this idea of the imminent cash crisis that Australia Post would face. And indeed, in recent days, the Australian government has granted immediate regulatory relief to Australia Post. Bear with me, everybody. I know we're going to be talking about the US Postal Service, but just um, I'll get there in the end. <laughs> that um, has basically uh, given Australia Post the ability to reduce its number of delivery days in metropolitan areas not in rural areas, but in metropolitan areas. So it will go from a five-day delivery week to three. or well, Sorry, I should say, to alternative day delivery. So the plan is at this stage to deliver three days a week one week and two days a week the following week. And a lot of um, posties that would ordinarily be delivering letters will be redeployed to deliver parcels because that's where the need is at the moment. But obviously there's an ongoing issue of there being losses in the letters. And so um, and that has been what's driven in the instance of Australia Post, it's what's driven this um, temporary regulatory relief. There's been a similar situation in France. Those of you who have been following there, uh, France's La Poste has gone down, went down to three days a week, has just been increased to four days a week delivering letters. So there is a lot of pressure out there at the moment on various um, mature letter markets. Let's put it that way, Paul. Right, we're dealing with a mature market, aren't we? So... My, I guess my question really is, you know, is there capacity for the government or the regulator in the USA to do something similar, to say, well, we don't need to wait for 
Congress or for uh, a, a, an executive order or whatever it might be, we can actually do this. We can grant regulatory relief in a, in a temporary sense in order to buy the time for these discussions to take place to talk about the future of the USA for the Postal Service. Is that a possibility? Well, it, it, it is a possibility, but I, I don't think it's the I don't think it's an advisable course. You know, addressing uh, postal reform issues is a very difficult issue politically. It's seen as something that's um, by a number of politicians uh, as a no-win situation. That it's going to lead to um, uh, higher prices. That it's going to lead to uh, service cuts of some kind, and that it's just not it's just not an issue that um, is attractive uh, to be involved in. You know, there are some tough decisions that uh, that have to be made. Uh, the Postal Service, to its credit, over the past two to three years has been um, uh, significantly raising the price of its packages to cover its costs. But it still does not um, have a true understanding uh, of all its costs, of its um, uh, different uh, products out there, which is something the um, its Office of Inspector General uh, has been very critical of. So I, I, I think realistically, if uh, if we don't address the USO quickly and at a time that uh, that it has to be addressed, if we plan to address it a year or two um, from now, the impetus to do it is uh, is just not going to be there. So I think it has to be done in conjunction with uh, any future financial assistance because. Congress has failed to do that for uh, 14 years at this point. There hasn't been a serious look at postal issues. The losses have been mounting, and it is um, uh, it is time to address that. Um, I, I would also say with respect to the, to the mature letter market, you know, mail is getting hit very hard right now uh, because of business contraction and COVID-19. But there has been a trend um, w- with a number of companies to integrate uh, postal mail with online campaigns into, um, I believe your guest Mark Fallon has uh, talked about this uh, this extensively. And there's, um, you know, there are uh, very significant opportunities that, uh, that come into play there. Also, you know, this fall in the United States, we have a present. We have elections in November, with um, a lot of people still being inside and weary of going outside. You know, as Mark has also mentioned, this uh, this should be a time of um, you know a great increase in uh, political mail. So, all, all is not bleak on on the mail front. Right now, the U.S. Postal Service is delivering six days a week. Uh, I think you said to all delivery points across the nation. So, even if you're living in remote Alaska, do you get yes. Wow, that's theoretically at least. Oh right, well look, we'll we'll, we'll leave that one alone then. Uh, <laughs> but so as now, as of now, it's six day a week delivery. Is there sort of any discussion at the moment about what if if there is a revision of the USO? What sort of proposals are out there? I mean, uh, is anyone out there pushing for a significant reduction in the number of letter deliveries per week? Or is anybody pushing for a return to the old days when you had two letter deliveries a day? Or anything like that, or a, or an extreme example like what's happened in Denmark. I say extreme. I mean, there's obviously the factors that have led to the, the letter right. volumes falling off a cliff. One of which being that the government sort of imposed digital government upon its citizens and said, "Right, that's it. We're going to do everything digitally." Again, it's probably a political discussion about that, mm-hmm. that could be had. Right. But what, what at this stage, have any options been put forward? Are any interest groups or any politicians or political parties putting forward a point of view to say, well, this is what we think it should look like. This is what we think the USO should be if we're going to have reform. The, the Postal Service has periodically floated the idea of cutting mail delivery back to um, five days a week. But that is just not going to be acceptable in the United States. In fact, at a hearing last uh, April 30th, Mark Meadows, who is now uh, President Trump's uh, chief of staff, uh, at the time he was the ranking legislator for the Republican Party on the um, House Oversight and Reform Committee, which oversees uh, the Postal Service. He made it explicitly clear in talking with the Postmaster General that he wanted to get a business plan from her, part and parcel of which would uh, include the USO, 
But under no circumstances should that talk about reducing mail delivery from six days a week. The U.S. Congress has required that every year since 1982. One th- the only thing and or the thing predominantly that um, uh, members of Congress and senators uh, hear about with the Postal Service are disruptions in delivery. There is a lot of concern, especially in rural areas of the country, and especially among senior citizens who vote and are local, uh, that mail delivery not be reduced by from six days a week. That's that's really a discussion that we've had in the U.S. at this point. Theoretically, it's possible that it will go forward, but um, I just don't see any way in which uh, Congress will accept a reform package uh, with that in there. You know, I, I think what's more realistic is to have some changes in the pricing mechanisms where you have uh, the price of mail uh, go up higher than it uh, higher than it is to cover that cost and to have that six day delivery. But for better or for worse, that is not going to be eliminated in the U.S. It's a non-starter, and it is even a uh, distraction as um, as part of the reform debate. So there's a lot of questions about what the USO should include, but it it's there's consensus that for better or for worse, that it should include six day mail delivery to all um, residential locations, at least in the United States. One last really quick question before we wrap up. In some countries, the the universal service obligation or the role of the post office, however it wants to be phrased, includes the retail network. So how many post offices there need to be or where the post offices need to be or things like that. Is that currently uh, set out in any sort of act or instrument in the USA? And if not, is there any talk of it becoming codified at all? There's a good uh, possibility that, um, especially in urban areas, the postal service can uh, transition to that type of uh, that type of lower cost operation, piggybacking on work in retail centers, convenience stores, uh, and whatnot. But again, another debate that we've had in the U.S. is in rural areas. The postal service has already closed and attempted to close a uh, number of um, of different uh, post offices. And some people already have to travel um, large distances uh, to get to a post office. So in the um, rural areas of the country, uh, that's really not an option. But um, in some of the more urban areas, especially where you have a number of post offices in close proximity to one another, and um, where you know people are less reliant on the mail or have things, um, you know, have um, packages delivered to their door. That uh, there is some possibility there. Of course, my personal opinion is that uh, there's always an option to go down a franchising model and run post offices in conjunction with existing retail businesses. And uh, I reckon there'll be plenty of retail businesses out there at the other end of this who will be looking for partners that will bring in a bit of foot traffic. But again. That's just my opinion. Paul Steidler, Senior Fellow at the Lexington Institute, thanks for joining me on the Postal Hub podcast today. It's been a pleasure, Ian. Thank you for having me. That's all for this episode of the Postal Hub podcast. You can subscribe to the podcast on Apple Podcasts, on Spotify, on Google Podcasts, and on other podcast platforms. Do you have an email address? Sure you do. Well, go on. Sign up for the Postal Hub e-newsletter. It's a weekly email update with the latest podcast and other news. Go to thepostalhub.com and sign up there. Would you like to join my LinkedIn network? Well, you can. But as I say every week, don't just send me an invitation and hope for the best. Customise that LinkedIn invitation and mention that you're a Postal Hub listener. If you want to throw in a bit of flattery, fine by me. If you want to contact me about anything at all, contact me via email. My email address is ian at thepostalhub.com. I'm Ian Kerr. Thanks for listening in, and I look forward to your company next time on the Postal Hub podcast.